Hello, today we're going to talk about disk friction. So disk friction uh, is the friction that exists between a rotating disk, so it's some sort of circular area, uh, and a surface that it's rotating against. Uh, so a clear example of this whole uh, disk friction scenario is going to be uh, a disk for a orbital sander. Uh, so in this orbital sander, we've got a circular pad that's rotating, uh, and it's going to be rotating and pressed against some sort of wooden surface. And so as you imagine, if you press the, these two things together, there's going to be some sort of moment due to the friction forces that's going to occur there. And this moment is due to the disk friction between those two surfaces. So it occurs whenever we've got relative motion, one surface sliding uh, against another uh, in kind of this circular fashion. So a common example, and where we're going to start our analysis, is with what's called a thrust bearing. And so a thrust bearing uh, is where we have kind of the end uh, of a shaft. Um, here we've got an end bearing. It'd basically be a circular shaft right down on the floor in some collar that prevents it from sliding back and forth. But the circular end piece here is going to rotate against the floor. In our collar bearing, we've got a shaft going th through some surface, but there is some collar around the outside that's going to rotate and slide against the surface it's going through. Um, we've got some load force that's pressing these things down into that surface, and the rotation. Uh, we've got a circular area, or kind of a donut-shaped area here with our bearings. So we've got this contact area, and there's going to be friction because there's a force uh, pressing these two things together. So for the surfaces in contact, the friction will be the same in all locations, uh, but the moments exerted by these friction forces are not the same. Uh, this is because the friction force at any one location is going to be the kinetic coefficient of friction. And assuming we've got two kind of uniform materials, that's going to be the same throughout, times the normal force. And so the normal force is going to be the pressure. And if we've got two flat surfaces, we've got a uh, single normal force, then we're going to have a uniform pressure wherever we are, which means that the friction force on this inside surface is going to be the same as the friction force on this outside surface. So that is useful, however, the moments uh, exerted by these two pieces are not equal to one another. So the center of rotation is in here. This inner force is the same as the outer force, but I've got a smaller moment arm for the inner surface and a larger moment arm for the outer surface. So the resistance to, to uh, spinning is smaller on the inside than it is on the outside surface. Uh, to figure out the overall uh, resistance to the moment. So this would be it's rotating in one direction, and we've got a torque that represents the losses uh, opposing that motion. I'm going to start with the following equation. So I need to sum up all of my moments uh, across the entire area, across the entire contact area between those two surfaces. And so this donut shape over here represents the contact in my collar bearing between this surface that the shaft's going through and the collar that goes around the outside of the shaft. So I sum up over the entire area those, all those little moments. And those moments, it's going to be, again, the kinetic coefficient of friction. This P value is the pressure at any one point. Uh, and R is the distance from the center of rotation. That's going to be the moment arm uh, in my uh, moment. Uh, and I sum that up over the entire area here. So if we move one step further, I can move some things around, try to simplify this a little bit. Uh, I have the kinetic coefficient of friction. I'm assuming that is a constant, so that I can go ahead and move outside of the integral. This pressure is also, I'm assuming, going to be constant, so that moves outside. And this value right here is going to be my pressure. So force over area. And I've got pi r squared minus pi r squared, basically. That's the area of my kind of donut shape. And so that leaves me with an R in here. That R goes down to here. And dA is the rate of change of the area uh, as I move from one position to the next. Uh, so I'm using kind of a polar, uh, ex expanding polar uh, in a polar fashion, uh, moving from the center or the inner radius out to the outer radius. And the rate of change of the area of this circle as I move greater and greater r's is going to be the circumference, or 2 pi r dr. So further simplify this whole thing. Um, 
2 pi is a constant. I move that out. The pi's will cancel each other out. That's 2. It's right here. And I'm left with r squared, and I'm integrating that dr. So the integral of r squared is 1 third r cubed. Uh, and going from the inner radius to the outer radius, that's where this top term comes from. And this bottom term over here is from my original area. Uh, so this is my final formula. This m is the moment that I lose due to the friction forces. So the moment that is the losses is 2 thirds times the kinetic coefficient of friction, times that load force, that's the force pressing the uh, collar into the actual surface that's sliding against, times the outer radius cubed minus the inner radius cubed over the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. And these are the collar, inner, and outer radiuses. So that is for a kind of donut-shaped contact area like that. If I have a solid circular contact area, so now I'm going back, this is the end bearing, and I have a solid cylindrical uh, piece, and so I've just got a solid circle like that. All I really need to do is I'm going to set the inner radius equal to zero, and this equation that I had on the previous slide down here uh, reduces to this. So two thirds, kinetic coefficient of friction, load force, and this outer radius of my shaft. So with that, that's all I have for thrust bearings. Next, we're going to move on to disc brakes. Uh, so disc brakes are very similar to those thrust bearings in terms of how they work. Uh, those bearings, we usually want to minimize the losses. In brakes, we want to usually maximize the moment or uh, the stopping power that these brakes have. Um, so <clears throat> similar analysis. What we're going to have uh, is basically a rotating um, plate like this. Uh, and we're going to have two pads that kind of press in, and so I've got a load force, two load forces pressing two pads into that circular area. So this is the contact area. We usually approximate it as basically a section of that donut shape we had before. So I still have an inner radius, an outer radius, and now I'm going to have some angle theta. Uh, and so if this is, say, 60 degrees, I'd have a sixth of the whole donut shape. So the Diagram is very similar to what we had before, except we've got some percentage of the original area, which is going to uh, decrease the area exerting the friction force. Um, so I have less area to exert that friction force, but at the same time, when I decrease the area for that load force, I'm going to increase the pressure. And so if I increase the pressure, I increase the pressure or the friction force that that area can exert. In the end, these two things end up canceling one another out. So even though I've only got basically one-sixth of that contact area, I'm going to have the exact same friction force as if I had the entire donut shape, which means that for a single brake pad, I have the exact same equation that I had for that collar uh, before. So two-thirds times the uh, kinetic coefficient of friction between the brake pad, pad material and the disc that's rotating. The load force is the pressure, or sorry, the, uh, the force the brake pads are pressed into the rotor with. And these are the outer and inner radiuses um, going from the center of rotation out to the outside and inside of my brake pads. Usually, though, we've got, when we have disc brakes, we're going to have a brake pad on both sides. So we've got one brake pad pressing into the front, another brake pad pressing out. And so they clamp together on that brake. Uh, and if that's the case, I've got two of them. I simply, mu simply multiply the original equation by two to find my torque or stopping power of the brakes. Uh, so with that, 